Hi, I'm Brandon. I'm from Bad Robot. So anyhow, Mari, as you can see, is QT-based. So that means you can move all of the interface pieces however you'd like to move them. So if you want to move your shader menu to this side, or if you want to kind of reorganize things, you can. And typically what I tend to do, which I do with all applications, is find a workflow and a layout that works for me. So keep in mind that you can customize it to whatever flow or whatever kind of optimization you find useful. I'm going to show you mine. So before we start, let me show you a few things I want to kind of set up. The first thing I set up in Mari is one simple shortcut. And that shortcut allows me to essentially go in and make it work quite a bit faster. And that shortcut is under the edit shortcuts. It's under painter and it's called clear painting. Since Mari's a projection painter, it tends to essentially treat the surface as if you're painting on a piece of glass. So essentially think of painting in Mari like painting on a sheet of glass that's kind of overlaid over your character, your model, your environment, and so forth. So what you tend to do with this mentality is you can paint on the glass, you can modify the paint on the glass, and then you can commit that change. You can apply it, bake it, if you will, onto the surface. So those of us who come from like a ZBrush background and body paint and all that, it's like we're used to painting directly on the surface. Mari's kind of a different step, but it has quite a few benefits that are kind of really advantageous in the fact that you can see your paint, you can offset your paint, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a shortcut, Shift-C, to clear my painting buffer. And the other thing I tend to set up on a brand new install of Mari is my layout. In this case, I'm going to cheat and use my own layout. So, ha. And kind of work through a few settings. So typically, the way Mari works is you paint on the surface, and you're good to go. And I can paint. And notice that it is essentially like painting on a piece of glass. I'm not actually touching my 3D model. What I'm doing is laying paint down on a surface that I can then commit to the surface. Hit the B key to bake. Wait a few seconds. The first initial projection tends to take a moment, but it's already done. And I'm just talking through it. And there we go. Good to go. Now that shift C that I was doing to clear the buffer, by default, my version of Mari is keeping essentially the paint on the surface of the glass. So to clear that, I hit Shift-C, and that gives me what I've just painted on. So what's nice about that is I can kind of set up where I'm going to paint. So for example, if I wanted to paint you know, something on this character, let's say, I don't know, I'm hitting the R key. You can see there's a nice contextual help up here that tells you what you're hitting. So R, drag the mouse to scale it. I'm just going to go ahead and you know, paint something on the surface. And it's a horrible smiley face, but whatever. And what's great is I can actually move this and place this wherever I'd like to, zoom in, zoom out, and kind of adjust where I'm going to place my bake on the surface, hit B to bake, and there you go. It's baked, ready to go. Needless to say, it takes a long time. Not really. This computer's amazing. And it's actually really quick on my computer at home, which has got a video game graphics card, a GeForce FX 470 with only four processors that are 2 gigahertz and 6 gig of RAM. And I can still paint the bad robot at 4K. So what's nice is I can essentially paint on the surface, see what it looks like, and then commit it. And once that commission's done, I can work. The other thing you can do, because you know everybody's like, oh, it's projection paint. Well, what's going to happen with projection paint? Well, we're all used to essentially when you're painting with projection paint, for example, if I paint green on the surface here and I bake it, it's going to shoot an arc all the way across the back of the surface, just like what body paint or anything else will do, and kind of give you these horrible stretches. So what's great about Mari, first off, is you can undo this thing all the way back to when you first opened your scene file. Like, that's how crazy the undo is. So what I can do is I can undo this back before I did that bake, get to where it is. I'm going to paint the exact same structure down, and I'm going to introduce you guys to edge masking. So edge masking works exactly like you think it works, which is it allows me to control how the fall off for the projection is going to actually behave. So what I tend to do is, when I'm first using it, is turn on mask preview. This is inside of the projection tab which you can access all of these tabs via the view palettes. You've got projection, pixel analyzer, history view, if you want to see everything you've done, kind of scares me, and quite a few other things. So I'm going to minimize the edge mask, and I can adjust it and see how the fall off works. So by default, it's red, but since the bad robot's red, I figured you, know, you my guys might want to see this. So I can actually adjust the mask, and in real time, you can see how it reacts based on what I'm looking at. So now that I'm doing that exact same projection, and I bake it across the surface, when I clear the buffer and look at it, you can see that, turning off the mask preview, it's not actually painting past any portion. This little bit that's clipped here, I just adjust the settings. And I've actually found that you know, typically a setting between 
0.7 and 0.5 on the fall off end and fall off start tend to work on 90% of the models I'm painting. And I rarely ever have to go crazy and adjust this and you know, it's not this big like inconvenience to keep looking at it. The other thing that's kind of cool is there's a mask preview for ambient occlusion. So Mari will actually take your model, calculate ambient occlusion. You can make an ambient occlusion mask, paint it, and actually treat your ambient occlusion with different surface properties just by painting the mask or calculate a standard ambient occlusion pass. And it's all really quick and it blows X normal out of the water. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the only other one I tend to use besides edge mask and ambient occlusion mask when I'm kind of doing things is a depth mask. And what that does is it allows me to adjust how the masking is working based on the depth of the camera. So it's good for certain situations like if you're painting like a raised pipe or some sort of rivet coming at the surface, it kind of helps kind of isolate it, especially like noses or places like that that just kind of really jut out in your face. So turning edge masking on, I can kind of go in and set up and figure out areas that I want to paint on, areas I don't want to paint on. And it's kind of cool to look at it with the edge mask, but after about 10 minutes I get sick of it and I kind of trust what I'm doing to just turn it off, disable it, and keep going. So that's one way to work. The other thing that's interesting is by hitting the one key, the two key, the three key, the four key, the five key, the six key, and not the seven key. You can actually quick snap everything into a straight kind of orthogonal viewport, if you will. I don't know how close it is to Maya, but it works damn well for me. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kick the radius up all the way. I'm going to turn off my masking completely. And I just want to paint this guy his base color, which is red. So to do that, I'm just going to run the paint across the entire surface, take a look at my projection here, and there's a couple settings that I can set. I can set manual behavior. By default, by the way, Mari auto bakes and clears. So what that means is, if you guys are like me, you like to paint and look at stuff. So you know, I'll paint, like for example, the spot on the surface, and then I'll go, okay, yeah, it's not baked, but that's kind of where I want it. And I can bake it and go. By default, in your bake behavior, this is under the projection tab, it's on auto bake and clear, which means if I move, it instantly bakes. So if you spent like three hours doing something and it bakes, then you know, that might kill you. Though I've never actually spent three hours painting a single stroke, but it could happen. I don't know. I'm going to turn it on manual. I'm also going to project through. So that essentially eliminates projecting only on the front faces and goes all the way through. So when I project and I bake and I count to 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 12, okay. Typically, what I, the reason why it takes longer, and a lot of people have talked about how Mari tends to be a little slower in the way it kind of works for the initial projections, is that what's happening with Mari is it's actually, by hitting this ortho UV, it's actually projecting a 4,096 by 4,096 or 4K map all the way across all of these patches at once. So when you figure that's a huge file that it has to write for the first time that it's projecting, you know, it's going to take a second. But guess what? I just painted across all of these patches. I can go and I can add a single spot right here on this one surface and bake it. And the baking time is significantly quicker. Bake and go. And I'm also painting right now in 16-bit color, not 8-bit color. You can also paint in float values. So there's ways to really kind of tune the performance based on the machine you're on to really make things work. And then from here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you guys kind of essentially my typical workflow for kind of roughing in and painting a character. Because essentially we're getting this program and we're looking at it and we want to paint on it. So why the fuck am I making you guys wait to paint? Okay, mask preview is enabled. So I can see what's happening. I have to toggle between. There we go. I'm actually going to leave it off because I'm very much into being wild about this stuff. So here is the robot. And I'm going to paint yellow. So a little more orange. I keep my color picker up and it's really easy. You can actually move the buffer between the UV view and the paint view. So right now it's painting on the glass in this particular portion. Now it's moving that paint to the other side. And that's pretty much instantaneous. There's no real lag on that at all. So I can go ahead and I can paint. It's pressure sensitive. So I'm going to go ahead and just lay down a couple coats of paint. And Jake will show you isolating. You can actually set these things into groups. Like I'm just kind of freestyle painting because I'm just crazy. See, the buffer needs to be cleared. I clear the buffer. You can just incidentally clear the buffer also by hitting this button, which is the paint clear buffer. But I find Shift-C tends to work quite a bit better in actually clearing the buffer out. So as you can see, I'm just kind of painting crazy because I don't really have any real worries because if I hit the E key, I can go to the eraser tool or just move there, and I can just quickly paint out whatever I haven't done. Or I can use channel masking, and there's quite a few other ways to do it. I can undo pretty much infinitely adjust the fall off of my brush. So I'll just go ahead and drop some paint down on the surface there. 
clear the buffer, and I'm pretty much ready to just kind of start doing a few fun things with this. So instead of getting deep into like all the crazy, super awesome features like shader management, and ambient occlusion, and light settings, and everything that is crazy, I'm just going to show you guys how to paint. And hopefully, it'll look like that, or not. Anyhow, let's start with that. So under your tab settings here, the shaders tab, the shelf tab, the painting tab, you think painting tab is painting, it's actually under shelf. You can store your own custom brushes here. You've got personal brushes. You can customize it. You can bring in bitmaps from Photoshop. Uh, I'm bugging them nicely to let me bring in actual Photoshop brushes so I don't have to do any work. And anyhow, things like that. So we've been using the hard brush typically to paint. I'm going to go ahead and play with some of these hard surface brushes and these organic brushes and kind of show you guys just a typical kind of like, let's throw something together and impress the people sitting and watching me. So it's all pressure sensitive. Right now I'm painting with the eraser, so you can see a lot of great, great stuff happening. P key goes to the brush tool, or you can just toggle it here. And I can just lightly start to kind of throw in a little bit of grunge, a little bit of texture, just kind of really make this robot sing, put a little bit of rust on him, and just kind of start populating this with something. Notice it's going back and forth between the two viewports. So if I want to work entirely in the UV view, I can. I'd have to adjust my scale a little bit, but I can kind of work it out from here. I'm going to go ahead and pick another sponge and just lightly kind of touch this back with the eraser. And then bake the surface down and be able to kind of, you know, preview it. Now, what's great about this projection painting, and one of the things I really liked about it is that when I'm painting on surfaces, sometimes I want to amp it up a little bit. I never really get the opportunity to. So if I don't move the viewport after I've painted, you can see it's still there. So I can use the same pattern and kind of drop it in other places. Or I can overlay it on top of itself, which is nice. In this case, I'm going to clear the buffer, and let's get up close. So I'm painting 4K maps. Essentially, I've broken his head out into one UV grid that will allow me to kind of lay it out. So what I'm going to do is work from there. There is a, uh, a problem with my hands sucking using precision movement on things like bars. So I use a mouse, and it tends to make my life easier. Anyhow. My favorite brush to use for typical laying out surfaces is this dirty airbrush. And it works really well for kind of just laying in a base coat. Holding R, you can see the actual bitmap that it's using. And you can scale it. You can also hit the W key, as you can see up here in the heads up display. Not to be confused with HUD from Cloverfield. Anyhow, I can rotate the image around, place it how I'd like. And then I can just kind of start dusting what I need to dust. In this case, I'm just going to kind of dust in a little bit of color change. Let's go a little darker, because I'm not really so on what's happening here. And then let's also take our paint. So anyhow, I'm just dusting a little bit on. I'm going to bake it, go from there. And right now, everything's kind of defocused. So what I want to do is I'm going to start playing with some other kind of effects. In this case, I'll use the dirty airbrush. I'm sorry, dirty airbrush, filthy airbrush. There's a filthy airbrush, and there's a dirty airbrush. The filthy airbrush lets you do things like this and really quickly like add a hell of a lot of grunge to it. So what I'll do is I'll say, OK, he's got a little bit of paint splatter there. There's a little bit of paint splatter here. Kind of throw some things in there. I'm going to go to the eraser switch to one of my sponges, and use that to kind of kick back on the effect of this dirty airbrush, and kind of just lighten it up just a little bit. There we go. Bake that down, and then start playing with some of the other brushes. So there's a great scuff brush, which I tend to use quite a bit for doing kind of essentially these metal kind of eroded surfaces. And like I said, seriously, you can supplement these with whatever you want. But I'll essentially hit P to go to paint, lay down a little bit of scuff so we can rotate it, we can actually not only rotate it, but we can squash it. So I can actually change the shape of it on the fly. And just kind of add in a little bit of change to it. In this case, I'm really going crazy with this scuff brush. Take that and then go to the sponge brush, hit my eraser tool, and just kind of dust it back. So I just kind of get a hint of what's happening with the scuff, bake it down. And as you can see, the bake's actually faster than me. And then go in there and start really adding in high-frequency detail. I can say, oh, you know what? I need to do a really quick layout for what's going to happen with essentially doing kind of, you know, beat up metal. So let's take this. We'll rotate it. I'm using essentially the rusty, uh, I'm sorry, the metal, the real metal flake brush. I'm not sure what it's called these days. But essentially, I'm just kind of adding bits of distortion in, going to my organic sponge brush. I tend to have a personal brush kind of setting that I tend to throw some of my favorite brushes into at work. But I wanted to show you guys from the point of view of just like, here it is. And just kind of, you know, really knock this back and paint in just a general idea for where the metals maybe flaked away on the side. 
after years. He's actually four feet tall, so this is horrible scale, but gets the idea across. So anyhow, bake it. Good to go. This is essentially one of the gecko skin brushes. There's a lot of crazy brushes. There's even a fingerprint, which I don't know if I would ever really use it. But if I want to put a fingerprint on, I can put a fingerprint on. So essentially, you know, I can go and I can say, oh, guess what? Everything I've done has been stretching. So the reason it's been stretching is I've been painting all the way through the model, and I've been painting without a edge mask. So I need to change this back to front facing, and I need to make sure that my edge mask is on. And the reason you do that is so that you don't have crazy crap like this happening. So the way you fix it is you can actually take, in this case, I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to make this work for me because I wasn't paying attention to my edge mask. I'm going to go ahead and take the sponge tool and just kind of paint this back out into something that's usable. And because I'm working with an edge mask now, when I bake, you're going to see that it's not going to go crazy. It's going to work pretty much like what you see right now. There it is, what I just saw. And I cleared the buffer. Now, the reason you saw, oh, it maybe got a little lighter when I moved is because the buffer was actually still active. So what I'm doing is I'm just kind of knocking this back and putting it kind of more in a usable realm. None of this would have happened if I would have, you know, left my edge mask on and set it to projecting only on the front. But that's the point of demoing. It's screwing up. Anyhow, it's really easy to fix. And what's great, too, about Mari is the way it handles textures. Like, essentially, when I painted this guy, I didn't paint him as the color with the dirt on top. I separated it. I had paint for just the dirt, paint for just the color. So essentially, what the new robot would have looked like versus what the old robot would have looked like, and kind of, you know, really pushed mixing layers together, almost as if I was using Photoshop. And the way that kind of works, C for the eyedropper, kind of paste a little bit back in. I'm going to go ahead and go to the eraser tool, kind of knock this back a bit. Okay, let's go to a little bit more detailed of a uh, erase, throw that in there. And good to go. The other thing that's great too for all you Photoshop people is I can actually take my brush, no matter what it is, and we're all used to holding shift when we're drawing on a surface, so I can actually go to the paint mode, not the eraser mode, and I can actually draw based on hard angles. So you can kind of plot out some pretty interesting shapes that way as well, which is great for doing like part lines and seam lines and crease lines and so forth. Also, I can do all of my painting completely in the UV view. So essentially, I can treat everything here and keep it completely isolated. And I can sample the surface and work. There's cloning tools and so forth to kind of go in and really kind of push it. But what I'll do is I'll just treat the surface and kind of get it where I think it needs to be. So I'll just put a little rust in. Switch to, you know, oh, we can do essentially skin brushes. We can do quite a few kind of, there's a lot of organic stuff here. I'm assuming that's when they were doing Avatar, they had a lot of organic models to do over hard surface. But what's great is the Organic brushes work great for actually adjusting your hard surface models. So I can go in and really kind of start pushing things. The other thing that's really, really cool about using this is right now I'm painting essentially with a normal brush. Just like Photoshop, you can actually do dodges and burns. So what I'll do is I'm actually going to switch to the dirty airbrush. I'm going to set the painting mode on the brush to color burn. Essentially take this down and I can just kind of, you know, get out of the eraser tool, hit P for paint. I can just kind of start cooking the model and really just kind of darkening the surface very, very quickly. And it works really well to kind of get a little bit grittier of an image and just to kind of show you how this works simultaneously on the model. Let's just go ahead and do that. Leave it that way so you can see what's happening. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to set this to a little bit of color dodge. Go to my hard surface brushes, turn on the scuff brush, and zoom up on this side, because this is actually where I'm going to paint in all of my detail. Turn off yellow. Let's go a little bit more towards the dark side. So I'm going to sample around there. And I can actually go in and just dodge the surface a bit as well and kind of get really nice breakup that works really well for kind of changing the surface and distressing it a little bit more. Something like that. Hitting E for eraser, kind of going back and knocking a little bit of it back, baking it down, clearing my paint buffer. Or I can keep it if I want it to double up and really kind of just work the surface down quite a bit. The other thing that's cool is you can do like, you know, I tend to do like lots of really small scratches and I'll just sample, okay, that's close enough to the color and I'll just kind of dot it, oops, P for paint. I'll kind of dot the surface with the color dodge. Do a little bit of like, you know, scratches across surface, go back, grab my organic brush, go to the eraser, 
kind of knock this back. And because everything's pressure sensitive, which it should be, I can kind of really start to wear the surface away and get some interesting effects. There's also multiplying, lightning, screening. These brushes tend to work better when you're dealing with channels. The overlay, soft light, hard light, difference, exclusion, basically everything you've ever seen in Photoshop has been converted for Mari use. The other thing that's nice is you can do a couple of like, you know, AI type brushes where you can run through and essentially paint, you know, multiple kind of strokes at once, design them into the brushes. I can kind of go and really start dusting this back and sample a little bit lighter color, sample this color, and just kind of really push it. And what's nice is if you got a boss who's in the middle of trying to go do something like direct a movie and he needs to see something quick, in a couple hours you can really start to give him something that's starting to feel a little bit better. And I can look at it as a flat shader. I can see what does it look like just on the surface of the model. I can go ahead and look at it with set lights. There's lighting controls. One of the feature requests that I have in there is the ability to hit a key and move the lights and essentially kind of go in and you know, move them all at once. But if, until then, I can actually go in and pick my key, my key light and my fill light, and essentially kind of move it around, see how the surface reacts. You can also paint spec maps and so forth on it. So essentially, there's a lot of really kind of cool things you can do really quickly and, you know, get a pretty good result. I can take this and convert it to a bump map and do quite a few things. So what I'm going to show you guys really quick before I have Jake jump on here is kind of, you know, one example of mixing a lot of these kind of dirt painting and grunge painting and so forth into putting a model together in a couple hours. I mean, this guy maybe took, I don't know, I think he took about four and a half hours to paint. I kind of got in a groove and I lost time, so it's pretty quick. So this essentially is all Mari pipeline. This has spec maps painted. It has ambient occlusion maps painted. It's got a bump map that's live real time. I can adjust all of those settings. And, you know, Jake's going to cover a lot more of kind of the specifics, but essentially what I can do is I can take a look at, you know, there's a lot of details. There's writing on the back, there's dirt, and it was all painted in Mari. I didn't use any real photo ref. Everything was kind of hand thrown together and just, it goes really, really quickly. It's kind of crazy how much time you lose. But by switching to the default shader, I can show you, you know, we have an ambient occlusion pass. The ambient occlusion pass on this guy, he's quite a few bit more patches. This is a little bit higher res, but I essentially have an isolated occlusion pass, isolated bump pass, different types of diffuses, I have spec passes. I can do a reflectance map if I want to take them into something. So this is kind of a modified reflectance map. I was testing a few things out here. There's just a flat color. Sometimes I do a little bit of development there. And then there's like the dirt. And the dirt has essentially is overlaid just like a layer in Photoshop. In this case, it's multiplied over the surface of the regular color. So all of these maps can be generated really quickly and put together. And I'm toggling right now, believe it or not, through, I don't know, 29, 30, roughly 4K maps. You're looking at 4K maps on the fly, and yes, I know we're on the supercomputer that destroys all supercomputers, but like on my computer at home, I'm like flying through this. It's kind of crazy. So, you know, seriously, it's when we were in the alpha testing, I kind of wanted to shoot myself in the head because it was really slow, but now it's much faster. So, anyhow, with that's about it. I uh, hope you guys got a little bit about how to do the brushes and the general idea of painting. It's not the most complex, but it should get you started in playing with it yourself. Uh, let me get Jake up here to show you shaders. Jake. Hello. My name is Jake Raymore. I'm a Noman grad, currently working at Bad Robot, and uh, I'm going to try to pick up a little bit where Brandon left off. Um, talk about channels, shaders, and I guess a little bit of overall project management. And just how you kind of get from point A to point B in Mari. All right, so here is a more or less finished project that I've been working on in Mari. And this guy has about uh, 12 4K textures in total. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is how we go from this mess of channels and this confusing looking panel of shaders to something that's usable and something that we can get back into Maya Softimage or whatever your package of choice is. So
So without further ado, let me get started. I'm just going to turn off a few things so we can see. Right now, I've got two shaders set up here. This one at the top I'm calling the baked shader. And if you look, just stretch this out a little bit, you can see that we've got bump, normals, uh, specular color, specular gain, and just a baked diffuse. Uh, very simple. And if we look at this snail body shader, which I guess I would call more of like a, a build, I've got a whole lot more that I'm not going to list through. So to get started, I would make a new shader. And if we apply that, we have a little UV view going on here. And next thing we need to do is make a few channels. So I'm going to make a channel. I'll call it Skin 1 at 4K. Make sure it's got an RGB and an alpha. And I'm just going to set it to alpha. OK. Duplicate that. Let's call this wrinkle. Duplicate. Oops. Freckle. And I'll just call this base chlor or color. <laughs> so using base color in the shaders, uh, as a default, you get this diffuse thing. So I'm just going to set that to my new guy here. And like we saw before, where is my projection palette? And I'm just going to change this to through. And now to get started, I'm going to open up this, the image manager, which is a great place where you can store any kind of reference images that you might be using. So let's open up this little guy. This was my go-to snail for the entire project. And I'm just going to sample a color to get started. I think I'm going to go kind of dark to get started. Ooh, and I think I'm... Uh, yeah, I'm on some crazy brush here, just a regular brush. Oop, and also, I don't need an edge mask on right at this point. Let's just cover him and bake him. Very simple, nothing more than a base coat, really. So now, in our shader menu, on shader 0, which I guess I'll just call new for the point of clarity, we're going to add a new shader module. And Mari gives you this collection of all kinds of preset shader modules. Um, and they can all kind of do slightly different things. Um, you can display bumps, normals. Uh, for the purpose of this, I'm going to use a diffuse blend, which is kind of like your go-to blending mode, um, much like a layer in Photoshop. You can see here blend mode. We have darken, multiply, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to set this guy to skin one. And also make sure I have skin one selected, so that's the one it's painting on. And now I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to go to shaders. Also, if you click on default, let me just, uh, I don't use a uh, hotkey for my clear. I like the little button down here. It's not there. Here. <laughs> Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, um, while I do this, this is kind of going to be a little organic painting demo. So let's go to shelf, and we're going to go over to these organic brushes. And I'm going to go grab this Octo Skin guy, which I'm a big fan of. Back to my image manager, and I'll just grab another color off the snail here. And add that. Oops. Get a little radius, and also. my brush palette. You know what? I'll just use hotkeys. And all I'm doing now is basically going to throw down some paint to really kind of just start breaking up the surface as much as possible as a start. And I'm just going to work on his face because we have other people that want to present too. So after that, uh, you can see, as Brandon said, the paint buffer's still there. But I'm going to kill it. 
go back to my shelf and grab this vascular brush and just kind of adjust my color here. Maybe a little more yellow, get in there. And again, just kind of break up the surface as much as I can until it begins to feel like kind of a natural thing. So, and this is not 100% natural, but it's getting there. So we'll bake that. And obviously, you can go as crazy as you want with this and just do whatever you need to do to kind of make it look like you want it to look. So I'm going to go back to the Octo skin, maybe kind of fill it in. Maybe I don't want it quite so cracky and broken. Give it just a little bit of solid area. Break that again. Bless you. Okay. And... Obviously, I did not have my edge mask on, so you can see the kind of stretching. We'll turn it on for now, even though it doesn't matter, because I'm only painting on this area. So, next order of business, now that we have skin one and our base color set up, let's add another diffuse blend. And we're going to set this to freckle. And I'm going to go to channels and select, oops, freckle, excuse me shelf and conveniently they have a freckle brush. So I'm going to go grab a different color here. Maybe tone it to like a, a little blue or something. And then where I feel like he should be kind of spotty, maybe we'll start adding in some fun little freckles for our happy little snail. And then also the erase brush can do the same thing with the freckles still selected and we can break it up. It's great, the paint buffer, um, because you can do so much as far as getting what you want in there before it's actually committed. So let's bake that in there. Go back to paint, clear this out. And again, I'm gonna change up my color. We try a different kind of freckle just until we can kind of speckle this in. It's a little light. So very quickly, um, we've built up a very broken up organic looking surface, which is not perfect by any means. But, uh, you know, time is basically what these things require to look good. So shaders. Add, diffuse blend. Now we've got another one, and we're going to set it to wrinkle. Grab our wrinkle channel. And now with so many 4K textures, you can really take advantage of the kind of detail that you can achieve. So I'm going to grab one of my favorite brushes, the fuzzy wrinkle brush. And now is when you can get really close up here kind of start defining all these little gnarly curves and lip wrinkles that I guess you would find on a snail. So and this is obviously uh, the time when you would put on your headphones, zone out for about four to five days. <laughs> or until your deadline was and, you know, get it done and do what you're paid to do, be an artist and make it look good. Um, this does not look great, but we're going to roll with it. I'll show you the finished product, which does look good. So, oops, let's pretend he doesn't have wrinkles and we're going to move on to <laughs> Here, look at this. Wow, that's awesome. Look at all this detail. Holy crap. That's amazing. So, you know, with some time, obviously, and some skill, um, you can paint in a really cool, really detailed kind of texture maps. And you can see that this one is also displaying bumps and stuff. Um, so, but if we go back, um, I don't want all these many, many blends kind of bogging me down and being confusing. So what I'm going to do is grab my shader, and I'm going to say bake shader. And what this is going to do 
it gives you some options. And all I want is the diffuse, because all I've been building really is a diffuse texture. I'm going to click diffuse, all patches, and I'm going to click bake. And here it goes, watch as it bakes. And basically, that's going to flatten down everything right to one texture channel called diffuse. And you can see we're just looking at the default. It's now all one texture, which you could then export to Maya or whatever. And that's essentially a workflow for building and moving textures into a usable form. The next thing I would do uh, in my shader is Mari has these great things called filters, which many people have used by a different name. So if we grab our base core, uh, go to filters and hue, I can, oops, let me just, uh, so we can see what's going on. I'm going to go to default when I do this, just because it's a little quicker to see what's happening. So grab that, shaders, filter, go to hue. And all I'm going to do is desaturate this guy. It just takes a second for it to process. Channels, freckles, same thing. Desaturate. And of course, if you were really doing this in production or whatever, you would probably be tweaking this to your liking. Uh, but what I'm really doing is taking all the color out so I can take this exact same layout and I'm going to bake down a spec map from it, which is the exact same process as baking down a diffuse map, except I've built it all using the same thing, uh, which is one of the great things about Mari is it's got a lot of tools to kind of give you one nice self-contained project where you would very rarely have to flip to another program to Photoshop or whatever. Um, to be generating these things. And it's essentially the same kind of basic texturing workflow that you would do in Photoshop. Like many people would just build their diffuse maps and then through the layers extract spec maps from there. So let me just, uh, what else do we have? Wrinkle, freckle, skin. I think that's all of them, right? So I desaturate and apply that. Same thing, I grab this and I'm going to bake it. Grab the diffuse channels just because it's using these little diffuse blend nodes. Bake, watch the little meter go up. If you work in CG, you know all about little meters going up. And diffuse two, we're just gonna call this spec baked. So now what you've got is a baked shader with very simple channels built from very complex networks of channels. And the last thing I'm going to show you on this snail is you can see that I've got a shell. And this shell is not very high res. Let me just show you. This is, uh, I forget how many polygons it is. It's not that many. Um, but we've also got this shell, which is very, very dense. Uh, somewhere up in the net, the realm of 540k. Um, and if you were thinking in kind of a pre-Mari workflow, you'd think, okay, I have to have this loaded as well as this loaded so I can just kind of transfer the shaders over. Um, and let me make a quick transition to this project, and I'm going to show you why you don't really have to do that anymore. Uh, Mari has a great tool to handle that called uh, OBJ versioning. And there's two reasons I'm opening up a new project for this. One is because the next model is a game res thing. Mari is great for not just super high res models, but we've also kind of taken some time to do low res stuff. Um, so if anybody's familiar with the Dominance War, um, I'm building this guy for the Dominance War, and it's just kind of convenient to show. Um, one of the conventions with game models is that they often have overlapping, or not overlapping shapes, but the same geometry sharing textures with overlapping UVs, um, which can be problematic. So one of the solutions to that is that make an alternate OBJ, hopefully this will make sense, um, and every overlapping texture 
It's just on a separate UV region, as you can see. And they've all just got the same texture loaded in. And you can paint on it, and they will all essentially bake down to the same texture. Now what I'm getting at is, this is my OBJ, and since I've got this kind of crazy UV layout that wouldn't make much sense in Maya or a game engine probably, what I'm gonna do is say add version, and I'm just gonna grab the OG layout of this, add that in there, and then when I wanna switch versions, um, and sorry, this is kind of tiny, but I can quickly switch to the original version and all my textures will overlap just fine. Again, leading us to the fact that I don't have to go back and forth to Maya and do a bunch of crazy switching and stuff. I can, before I even get in here, I've already laid out my two models and it's all set. So, and just to reiterate, I'm gonna go a little bit back into what I was saying. The way this guy's laid out is very simple. All he has is a color blocking channel, a channel of painted values, um, and a line work channel. So now I can grab, say, a metal grunge thing that I wanna do. Maybe I wanna dirty him up. And I'll just grab the same kind of hard surface brushes that Brandon was using doesn't work if it's the same color. Maybe set this to multiply. And just kind of start dirtying things up. And then, obviously, I would go in here when I was done and bake these down to one complete map that I could export out. So, and if you're wondering, I've got kind of all this grunge splashing all over everything, which may or may not be desirable, depending on what you're doing. Mari has plenty of tools to help you with that. So let's talk about selection groups for just a second. If I go hop in here to my UV view, just clear out the paint buffer, and go to select. Uh, da -da -da -da. Hopefully this. One second. Face mode, select. Uh, I seem to be missing a little palette. The little, little. Ah, oh, there we go. You have to select the select tool. <laughs> so, and then we should be able to. Oops, hold on. Uh oh. Okay. Well, um, I think my project is freezing Mari, but ideally, what you can do is basically select these by island, and each one can be made into a selection set, which, if I had done it right, would be right here, and you can quickly hide little islands and basically lock them, hide them, any kind of layout you would want to do to isolate things, as well as also being able to isolate by UV patch. So if you're doing a more high-res thing like Brandon was showing, and you've got your UV groups laid out, say like hands, head, feet, you can also mask by that. Um, and I think that's all I've got for you. Hopefully that kind of demystifies a little bit about the shader and channel system and shows how it's a little bit similar to Photoshop layers, but really kind of catered to 3D painting uh, in a way that seems really intelligent, intuitive to me. And we've been able to create lots of texture maps for any models ranging from high res to low res very quickly. Um, and you know, if the baking time is an issue, I would say it's still faster than saving out a version of Photoshop and having another IPR render in Maya. So I will leave you with that. Thank you.